You're listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author Sarah Box, where you get the inside scoop on the steps action takers and decision makers take to align their purpose to their principles and achieve their goals in business and life. We focus on the mantra, no labels, no limits, no excuses. And now, without further ado, please welcome your commanding coach with plenty of chutzpah and heart, Sarah Box. Hi, this is Sarah, your host of the No Labels, No Limits podcast, where we talk with inspiring guests who have challenged limiting labels and beliefs to pursue and accomplish personal and professional goals. Sometimes I think the personal and the professional, there is no distinction between them because we have a continuum in our life and we'll be interested to learn more about that continuum and its life-changing effects with today's guest, who is Richard Allen. Now, Rich has been fortunate enough to work for some of the world's largest corporations. He's met many really wonderful people, and as a result of that, he has stored a lot of rich memories. Um, But that actually changed for him when he lost both his father and his father-in-law over the last couple of years, just a little more than two and a half years. Those deaths in particular were the catalyst for Rich actually leaving the corporate world and then shifting his focus to becoming a writer. Now, he was successful in the corporate world, so this is a big shift. Today, Rich is an author who writes about coping with grief when losing a loved one. His books include Keeping Calm and Cope, Keep Calm and Cope with Grief. That was his first book, and it has now helped thousands of people all over the world. He's working on his last, his most recent book, number four, which I just learned pre-record is done. And that book is for children. And he started that because he's been asked by so many people to write a book that can help children cope with grief. Mm -hmm. grief. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about that with Rich. And before I bring him on, I just want to say that Rich reminds us that it's important to find a way to cope with grief and find what works for you, even if it doesn't fit someone else's recipe. So with that, um, let's bring Rich into the podcast. Rich, how are you doing? Hey, Sarah, I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm also doing really <clears throat> well. Um, awesome. It's, it's a Friday as we record this. I've yeah. had an interesting week, been in many different geographic areas, been talking with the team that's out in the field. So many things to be thankful for. And and then you and I were talking about glitches, right? So you had a yeah. glitch. I've had tech get glitches, and you just kind of shrug your shoulders and go, here we are. So, um, Rich, before we get into it, though, I do want you to share, if you'd be so kind, as mm-hmm. to what happened to you in the Walmart parking lot and how that relates to a story many years ago when your daughter was only six, because it's a great story about uh, personal accountability and hope. That's right. So um, I d- I'm saying being a guy, maybe not all guys are like this, but I typically change my car every year, which is not a good financial decision. <laughs> I just love cars and trucks. Anyway, the, the truck I drive right now, I've, I've had for six years and I own it, which is a shock, no finance. Anyway, I love my truck. Well, on Wednesday of this week, I was at the Walmart where I live. And I was picking up a, a last minute gift from my fiance, Alison. It was a birthday yesterday. Anyway, I, I have the gift. I'm coming out of Walmart. And there was a young boy, 18 years old, standing next to my truck. And he said to me, I'm so, so sorry, but I've hit your truck. I was like, oh, no. You know, there was, wasn't a scratch on my truck. Anyway, I looked at the damage and it wasn't too bad. But, but this boy was so sweet. And he kept saying to me, I want to do the right thing. I'll pay for the repairs. I'm so sorry, you know, um, um, you've got a lovely truck. I, I can't believe what happened. And he was just so genuine and so nice and sincere. I was like, wow, how could I be angry with this boy or upset? You know, at the end of the day, it's just a car. It's just my truck. Anyway, we exchanged details. And uh, this was Wednesday. And yesterday, his father called me up. And the first thing I said to his father was, you've got a great son. He's going to make a fantastic young man. You know, um, you must be so proud. And he said, I am. We've brought him up to do the right thing, you know, and I'm glad he stayed. I'm glad you exchanged details. And Mr. Allen, you know, we'll get your truck fixed. And I said, well, thank you. And it reminded me, Sarah, of, of this incident. And this was 23 years ago with my daughter. 
Jessica. So this was back in Liverpool and uh, Jessica was about six at the time. And I drove to um, my local bank and I told my daughter, Jessica, you stay in the car, lock the doors, I'll only be two minutes. I went into the bank, I came back and Jessica was crying. I said, what's wrong? And she said, well, the man next to us in his car has hit our car, daddy. And I looked and I could see this big scrape all down the side of my, my car. And while I was looking, this older man came out of the bank and came up to me and he apologized and said, I'm so sorry. I was in a rush to get to the bank to make a deposit before they closed. I know I've damaged your car. I will pay for repairs. And I told him, well, that's so sweet. I said, but I'm more concerned about my daughter because she's upset. And he had no idea Jessica was in the car when he hit my car. And he was apologetic. He, he apologized to Jessica. Such a sweet, sweet dear man. And he said to me, don't worry, I'll pay for your repairs, which he did. Anyway, several weeks later, he came to my house and I invited him in for a cup of tea. And he said to Jessica, you know, I'm so sorry, but it's always important to do the right thing. And in his hand, he had this little jewelry box and he gave it to Jessica and she opened the box and inside was a necklace and a little pendant. And on the pendant, it said, choose the right thing. And I was like, wow. And then he proceeded to tell this story that in life, Jessica, you should always choose the right thing. Always do what's right. And he said, you know, it doesn't matter if you're on a train, on a bus, and you don't know the fare. Always pay a little bit more if you're not sure. But always do that right thing. It's so, so important. And to this day, Sarah, she's kept the necklace and the pendant. And we still talk about that sweet little old man who gave us that message of doing the right thing. And it reminded me of this boy on Wednesday, you know, he did the right thing and he doesn't know between us. But once this is all fixed, like my truck is repaired, obviously I know where his, his, he lives and his dad, I'm going to send him a replica pendant on a chain or maybe a bracelet for a guy, maybe a necklace, maybe a bracelet that says on it, choose the right thing or do the right thing. Because I think that's an important message for us all. And I'd like to send something to that boy to thank him for being honest and doing the right thing. Yeah, for lifting him up for what he did that he mm -hmm. knew was right. He didn't yeah. do it expecting to get anything back other than yeah. that's the right thing to do. I love that story so much, Rich, and thanks yeah. for telling it again. Because for me, you know, we hear a lot of negative things about young people, which I run into so many and have a grandson who pr proves them wrong every day, right? It's like great kids doing the right thing. Even their kids, they mess up, things happen, but they're the right thing, right? And, but us as adults need to do the right thing too, like that older gentleman did for your daughter. So um, yeah, I really yeah. think that's a, a super inspiring story. And I'll be excited to hear if you let us know when you're done, how it went when you give him his gift. Sure, absolutely. Which yeah, yeah. Hopefully the podcast, he won't hear it first, but if you ever decide to share it with him, say, we led this off with a story about you and what a great person yeah. you were. So yeah, anyway. His name was Lance. So his Lance. name's on it now, Lance. Okay. Yeah. It's all about guy, you, Lance. You've inspired, yes. you've inspired both Rich and I again this morning and every person who listens afterwards. So now that we're done getting inspired by Lance, I want to mm -hmm. shift the story back to you. And okay. can you talk a bit about how you arrived at the decision to leave your corporate position and then what that process was for leaving? And then we'll get into actually your experiences with your dad and stuff. But yeah, I know a lot of our listeners want to know when I decide to go, what do I do? How hard is it? All the doubts that folks can have about that big change. Yeah, I mean, um, so it was because my father passed away to cancer. And I, I worked for an insurance company in the United States for 15 years. Absolutely loved it. I was truly blessed. I, could, I was traveling America to train um, agents on commercial insurance. So I could be in California, Ohio, Florida, Texas. I mean, you know, it was a great opportunity for me to see America. And it was free. You know, my employer was paying for it. Um, so I loved my job, but then when I found out my dad had cancer and then of course he, he did pass away in 2020, um, 
I, it's so, it, I tell you what, it was Alison, my fiance, because Alison said to me, Rich, you should write a book about this. And I've never written anything in my life. And to be honest with you, my spelling and grammar is not good. <laughs> um, but thankfully, there's editors out there who can edit your work for you, which I did on all of my books. Anyway, um, you know, throughout life, I think we collect things, don't we? Um, whether it's physical things, whether it's memories, we just collect things. And during the process of losing my father, Sarah, um, I collected things, whether it was pamphlets from the church, from the funeral home, um, condolences cards, you know, uh, memories from aunties and uncles visiting my mum and dad's house and um, to share their sympathy with us. So I'm collecting everything. And when we came back to America after my dad's funeral, it was then that Alison said to me, you know, Rich, you can write a book about this. And at first that we just, dis I dismissed it. I thought, no, you know, I thought she was just joking with me, but she was deadly serious. Anyway, I started making some notes and writing things down. If you could see my desk, it's covered in post-it notes and I'm always doodling. And before you knew it, I'd written chapter after chapter and I had nine chapters. So I sent it off to an editor that I found. It was edited and formatted for me. And then I got a, a cover designer for the front and back cover in the spine of the book. Anyway, it was up on Amazon. And I was shocked by the response. People writing to me, going to my website and sharing how thankful they were for my message and, and helpful information in this book. And it, it just took me from there. And I suddenly realized my, my mom and dad always help people. And I think myself and my sister are exactly the same. And I thought, I want to do this. I want to help people. I can share my story, but I can share information as well, you know, from our research and, and just talking to other people. As I've just shared there about Lance. I mean, that's, that's a great story. And the old man from the bank. And as we go through life and we interact with other people, we learn so much. And I think we can take the positive and sometimes the negative to learn, and we can pass that on to other people to help them. And I believe that's, that's what I'm doing. And for me, I'm, this sounds like I'm boasting or bragging, and it really isn't, but it, it, becomes, it comes easy to me. I mean, it does, right? If you're a good person, when you help somebody else, it's easy, right, Sarah? That's not a hard thing There's to do. There's science behind that because it, it you, has a reinforcing neurochemical positive in your yeah. system. So you want more of that, you will do more of that behavior. It's a self-reinforcing behavior. And you're absolutely correct, Rich. It feels great to help someone, even if it's just something simple, like mm -hmm. I can't get this working on my phone. You go, oh, let me help, right? Yeah. yeah. Three minutes, it's done. They're happy. And you feel good. They feel good. Yeah. Right. It, it's it's really a great way to go through your day. Yeah. So I thought, okay, um, great. I've written the first book. It's doing great. And then I thought, this is for me. So I, I did. I, I left that corporate world. So it, it came out of the blue, total surprise. Like I said, I'm not good at English or grammar. Um, but there are people out there who can edit the book for you. Um, so we're truly thankful for that. Um, and. I said to Alison, because she said, what are you going to write about next? And I said, I don't know. And I, I can't force it. I know there might be other authors out there. I don't know. But maybe they just write book after book after book. And I'm certainly not one of those people. So my second book came along because I have this passion. You know, when I get an idea, it's like, yes, I want to share that. I want to write about it. I think it's important. So my second book, Life After This, was about life after this, like what happens to us after we die? Where do we go? And I did a lot of research and I also shared a lot of stories about the signs I've had from my dad. I mean, I've, I've had so many messages and physical signs from my dad. Could you share a couple, Rich? Absolutely, 100%. When we leave this earth, this body that we're in, there is life after this. And I thought, yes, I'd love to write a book about this. So I, I did. And again, I've had a great response. It just blew me away. So I know I'm on the right path. I know writing now is, is my calling. I'm 56 years old, so I wouldn't like to say it's come late in my life because things happen for a reason, right? And this has just happened for me at this time. My dad has passed over, but he still communicates with me with his signs. And 
here I am. I've written book number three, Nature's Reach, all about nature, helping us with grief. And as you mentioned before, I've finished book number four, which is for children coping with grief. Um, so I'm, I'm excited. Yeah. So let's go and, and share a little bit about how you see signs of your dad. And um, mm -hmm. because I'm curious for other folks who might be going, well, am I just imagining this or is that my is that my loved one? You know, I mean, it's yeah. just a couple of your stories that, you know, folks might go, oh, that's not true. And then you go yeah. figure it out then. Right. Yeah, sure. So I, th I think we can agree. And you tell me if we don't, Sarah, but I think grief, in my opinion, anyway, is like the most complex of emotions, grief. I do. Agree. And OK. And I also think that it's unique to each of us. We all go through it deep, complete like me and my sister. We love our dad so so much we miss him so so much but i know we go through it differently so it is a very unique experience and um, so the signs from my dad um gosh there's, there's been so many so what i would say is and again this is just my opinion keep an open mind that's what i do keep an open mind and you cannot force these messages or signs I can't, I still have my dad's cell phone number in my cell phone, right? I obviously, I cannot text my dad and say, and wait for a response. It doesn't happen that way. I cannot send an email to his email and wait for any, it doesn't happen that way, right? We know that, of course, but these signs come at random times um, and just blow me away. And um, so I would keep an open mind and whenever things happen, sometimes I don't immediately think that's from my dad. Alison will say, do you think it's your dad? And then I put two, two together. I think, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maybe you're right, you know? Um, but there's been so many. So I'll give you a couple of quick examples here. That, That'd be uh, great. So, so here's one that happened only a couple of weeks ago. And you tell me if this was not my dad. See what you think. Honestly, I mean, obviously you don't know my dad, but see what you think. So when my dad... But this was in February 2020. I'm in America. My dad is in Liverpool, England. And my dad sent me a text message to say he had cancer and there was nothing they could do. The doctors had said the chemo radiation will not prevent his death. And I was devastated. Alison and I flew over to Liverpool to spend a week with my, my mum and dad and my sister. And it was a horrible time, but it was a wonderful time to be with him. Anyway. We stayed in a hotel because I didn't want to stay in the house with my dad to cramp his space. There was a lot of emotion going on. Anyway, we're on the fourth floor of a hotel in Liverpool so we could oversee the city. And at two o'clock in the morning, Alison and I were still awake and we were sitting by the window of the hotel and outside on the street at 2 a.m. was a man playing a guitar and singing. And he was playing Sweet Caroline by Neil Diamond. Now, I don't know why, but that song reminds me of my dad. If you listen to the lyrics, it's a very touching song. It really is. It is. And yeah, and it, it, it stuck with me. So every time I hear that song now, I'm reminded of my dad and I get tearful. I just can't help it. Now, fast forward to just two weeks ago. Now, when I go to bed and Alison goes to bed, we put our cell phones on the nightstand, you know, on my side and she puts hers on that side. And I plug in the charger cable. And I think like most people, my phone is locked. You open the phone with your thumbprint or a code, but it's locked. Okay. We're asleep. 1.16 a.m. 1.16 a.m. in the morning, my cell phone goes off. Sweet Caroline is playing. And it wasn't the start of the song. It was the chorus. And it was full blast. And I woke up, looked around the room in darkness. And I shouted, Dad, Dad. Sorry. And uh, I thought, what's going on? I was confused. I was like, what's going on? And Alison woke up and she said, what's going on, Rich? I said, I don't know, but my phone's playing that song. Sorry, Sarah. And um, You don't need to I, apologize for having feelings. <laughs> it's, not, it's not against the rules. <laughs> and I picked up my phone and my phone was unlocked. It's, that's never happened. I've had a cell phone for, what, 20 years? It was unlocked. So 
Oops. It looked like this. You know the way you can see the apps? Yep. I'll put the eye yeah, yep. oh, yeah. on there. Now, I'm a bit of a, a nerd. When I go to bed, I close all of the windows and all of the apps so there's nothing open. So I looked at my phone, and it's still playing, Sweet Caroline. But there was nothing open. I do not have that song on my phone. It's not in memory. It's not there. Pandora was closed. Spotify. There was nothing open. And I couldn't get the song to stop. It just kept playing. So I ended up pressing the power button to get the song to stop. And I sat there with Alison, and we were in shock. And she looked at me, she goes, it has to have been your dad. And I was like, I, I couldn't explain it. Why that song when it's not on my phone? I don't know. And I keep an open mind. I, I say this in all my, bo my books. I think I'm a logical person. It could be for some other reason. But what if it was my dad? I can't dispel that because only my dad knows, I guess, that that song is so important to me and it reminds me of him. It's just that one song and that was the song that played and here, here's something else that's a little you might say far-fetched i don't know 1 16 a.m so from time to time i look at the bible and if you go to romans in the bible if you go to romans verse one uh, sorry chapter one verse 16 i can't remember it word for word and unfortunately i left my bible downstairs but if you read that verse it, it says, he who believes in me believes in the afterlife, is basically what it says. And I'm thinking, maybe too much, but why would it be 1.16 a.m.? And why would that in, that, in Romans 1.16, tell me? It's like a message from my dad to say, Rich, it's I'm okay. okay. Yeah. I'm okay. There is life after this. And I was just blown away. I mean, phew. so let me ask you in that moment, yeah, how did you feel in your body besides being blown away? Like, what were your, was your heart racing? Were you feeling full and love? Were you feeling like what was going on with you? I, I was, I was, uh, my heart was racing. I felt so much pain and yet so much love for my dad. And I wanted more. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sure lots of people can relate to this. I physically wanted a conversation with my dad. I thought, if he can do this, talk to me, dad. I want to hear your voice. Speak to me. Literally speak to me. You know, I know it sounds stupid, but I well, was it just, doesn't I, sound stupid at all. I wanted but more. Yeah. It sounds like he was speaking to you. Yeah. And he's yeah. probably been speaking to you and you've been not hearing him. And he's going, all right, I'm blasting music when I know <laughs> that you can't yeah, do and, and that's another thing. These signs. One of my friends, um, he lost his father over 30 years ago, and he's told me he's never had a sign from his dad. And I said, well, it could be a couple of things. One, your dad doesn't feel like you need a sign. He's a strong man, you know, independent. He's married with a child. Maybe your dad doesn't feel you need a sign. But two, maybe your dad sends you signs and you just don't see them. You miss them. And that's okay. You know, I'm sure I miss a lot of signs from my dad too. And my sister might and my mum might. But that's life. But maybe some of these signs get through and we do see them and we do hear them. We do touch them, you know, and that's just the way it works. We can't question it and think, here's the answer. I don't think we'll get that answer. That's just the way it works. Um, I agree with you. I mean, I don't think, yeah. I think our, ra like when you say you're a large, logical person, rational, I'm thinking our rational mind wants to have hardcore facts and evidence, right? Yeah. And yeah. I think the degree to which we want that, people have wanted that millennium, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't think we'll get that. But I also believe that when you get a sign or a sense, and it might not be as overt as your phone going off, yeah. um, but there is that sense of knowing in your heart, like it's just a click and you're going, this is true. I don't know why I believe it is true, but I, I know that what I just felt or experienced is real. And um, can I prove it? No, but I believe it. So I think it's just being open to that and listening. So we just finished talking about one sign from your dad. Um, yeah. Could you share one more with us? Yeah. So when I when I was I, I sit at this desk where I write my books, and I was I was sitting here, and I was in the process of writing my second book, Life After This, and 
I can't remember how far into the book I was, but anyway, I needed a break. So I was just, you know, needed a break, time out. So I sat back in my chair and I looked around this, this room and I called out to my dad because I was getting emotional, you know, talking about my dad and writing about my story with my dad is obviously emotional for me. And I said, dad, if you're here with me now, you know, give me a sign. I hope you're okay. I miss you so much. Wherever you are, dad, I hope you're okay. I really do. And then I opened a browser on the internet and I looked at cars and trucks. <laughs> I think that's what guys do. <laughs> so I started looking at, at trucks and I found this website and it had, I don't know, 40,000 trucks, you know, and I clicked on one at random and I think it was a Ford F-150 and I'm clicking through the photographs. I think there was like 50 plus photographs and you know how it is. They show the front of the truck, the back, the sides, the wheels, and then inside the truck. So the pictures I'm looking at, I'm sitting here looking, and they had a photograph of the steering wheel and the dashboard. And then there was another photograph of the, do you call it the, the touch screen, you know, the infotainment thing, right? And it, on the screen at the time when the person took the photograph, the radio must have been on. And it had the date, the time, the radio station, like 107.6 or whatever, and the temperature outside. And the name of the song that was being played at the time was, I Am Alive. And I'm like, oh, because I'm literally, Sarah, this was like two minutes before I'm saying, Dad, wherever you are, give me a sign. I hope you're okay. And two minutes later, I look at this picture saying, I am alive. Now, I didn't know there was a song called I Am Alive, and we looked it up. And for the life of me, I can't remember the name of the group. Um, but if you listen to that song, the lyrics will freak you out. It's all about, I'm here for you. I am alive. And, and me and Alison, we found it on Pandora or something, and we listened to it, and we were like, wow. But I, I can't explain that. How can that be? I didn't know there was such a song. And I've looked at many pictures of trucks, and they don't have that on pictures saying I'm alive. No, it's usually they keep that stuff out. You know, they just keep yeah. it blank so you can envision what you want on the internet. Yeah, and so right. And I, I wanted to put that picture. I kept it. I, I can send it to you. I have a screenshot of the dashboard, and it shows that song, you know, I am alive. And I wanted to put it in, the, in this book, uh, Life After This, but for copyright reasons, I couldn't do that. Um, but to this day, it's just another one of those moments on my list of like my dad reached out to me when I needed it. Just to let me know, Rip, son, I'm okay. I'm alive. It's so blows my mind. You have had, first of all, you've got many things going for you. One is you're willing to be open and pay attention. You've got Allison mm -hmm. who kind of sits by your side and says, hmm, could this be right? Yeah, right. With you and support you. Um, and I know that you have done research for your books about the science behind stress and grief, mm -hmm. specifically caused by loss, right? So right. what are some of the ways that we can cope with grief after loss, you know, like to go about yeah. picking up the pieces? Because we do get shattered by that. And then we're right. still whole, but we, we feel like we're in pieces and it, the world just is moving on. Right. I mean, as we, as we said before, right, it's so individual. And it, for, for me, anyway, it's been the most complex of emotions. Um, so I, I would say this. I would say you have to find what works for you. So never, ever give up. Don't think, well, I've been to a doctor, I've taken medication, I've been to a counselor, I've joined a therapy group, you know, a group on Facebook even, and it's not worked for me. Please keep trying and never give up because what works for somebody else may not work for you. So you have to find what works for you. And it could be a combination of things. Uh, a number of different things have worked for me. And through writing these books and the research I've done, I'm just amazed at what's out there, the different techniques, you know, even from like meditation. But, but for me, I've always been a spiritual person. I think if you know my background, you know, I went to the school of St. John Bosco as a child. Uh, I had priests for teachers. Uh, we went to mass every day. I was an altar boy for many years. And I went to seminary school thinking I was going to become a priest. Um, but it, it didn't happen. Here I am. 
Um, but anyway, religion's always been a big part of, of my life. And it's helped me with the loss of my father, no question. But also nature has helped me. And that was my the reason for my third book, Nature's Reach. I mean, there's something out there, and I never knew this until my research, called SAD, S-A-D, uh, Seasonal Effect Disorder. Like the seasons of the weather. And if you think about it, it makes sense. You know, in the winter, when it's cold and gloomy, we kind of feel miserable and down. But when it's sunny in the summer or spring, we feel happy. You know, it's affected our mood. And sure enough, I think the weather, as well as nature, can help us. I'm truly blessed, Sarah. Alison and I live in a house on a lake. We were so lucky to find this location. So we have deer. I feed deer by hand. We have geese, ducks, possums, raccoons, um, bald eagles, squirrels everywhere. Oh, my goodness. So I have all these animals around me, and we give them names. And I can sit outside in the backyard quietly, just look at the trees moving in the breeze, feel the sun on my face, feed the squirrels and the deer. And it, it just brings me back to where it grounds me in some way. And it for me, I feel closer to God and I feel closer to my dad. You know, just nice and quiet. Now, somebody else might try that several times and say, didn't do it for me. Maybe for them, it's going to a rock concert or, you know, it, or a sporting event where there's thousands of people and it's noisy. Maybe that helps them in some way. It's bizarre, but it can happen. It's just different. For me, I like to go to church when there's nobody there. I, I hate to say it, but I haven't been to Mass. I go every Christmas, but I haven't been to Mass for many, many years because I believe you can pray anywhere. I don't need to be in a man-made building that's called a church to pray to God. You can. I'm not saying that that's wrong. I'm just saying for me, I, I can pray anywhere. Um, but I like to be in a church when it's quiet. I can be alone with my thoughts, look at the stained glass windows. I can smell the wood, the incense of the church. I just feel more spiritual and connected that way and closer to my dad, you know? Um, so you've got to find things like this that work for you. Um, and, and maybe, you know, you lost your mum or your dad. And I've done this too. You can replicate some of the things that you used to do with your loved one. Maybe you and your loved one used to take the dog for a walk. As down like a certain path go with that dog go on that sit on that bench that you used to sit with with your loved one it can really help and don't be afraid to talk out to your loved one maybe not loud because people might lock you up <laughs> but you know you can have a quiet word with them i think all of these things can be very very therapeutic as, as certainly for me it, it's really helped but like i said don't give up and find what works for you it's there i, tr I promise it's there and I, I think they're, that's so wise because we often feel everything should be able to be done formulaically, like step one, step two, step three, and it doesn't necessarily fit for everybody. Yeah. Um, or we start judging ourselves like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm not grieving enough or in the right way, right? We yeah. don't allow that we're each individuals and unique. So you said you have a list of resources that can help our, our listeners. Mm -hmm. um, through their dark days. Is that on your website? Is that in your books? Where where yeah. could someone listening find that information? So they can, you can go to my website, which is richardjohnallen.com, and you'll, you can contact me there. But in the back of my first book, Keep Calm, Cope With Grief, there's a whole section. I actually call it, um, like, it's not a medical kit, but it's a, a cheat sheet of helpful resources. And it's got everything in here, whether it's, you know, um, psychology, whether it's therapists, um, whether it's chat rooms on Facebook or Twitter or Instagram and TikTok even. Um, but, and there's a list of self-care tips and websites that you can go to. So it's in the back of my first book, Keep Calm and Cope with Grief. But again, if, if any of your listeners want to contact me, I can send them a PDF of that list um, and but be more than happy to do that, of course. Yeah. That would be sweet. Um, and I know that you did offer, if folks came to your web website, oh, enunciation, Sarah, um, if they go to your website, um, mm -hmm. that you do have um, a chapter or two of your book that is available to them. Is that correct? They can ask you for that? 
Yeah, I can send them a seven-step guide. Is that what you're referring to? Yeah, yeah that's right. It's a seven-step guide on how to cope with grief. Just simple steps that you can do that can help you get through these difficult times. Um, you know, it, and again, it, for me, I, I, can, I have a, such a close family, such a great relationship with my mother and my sister and my dad. And with the passing of my dad, hard to believe, but it brought us even closer together, you know? Um, and again, when you lose a loved one, Sarah, and you know, there's, the, there's so many physical things that need to be done. Like when my dad passed away, I helped my mum. I, I, my mum actually asked me, can you do it, son? And I said, of course, mum. I had to cancel my dad's driver's license, his passport, change the car insurance, close his bank accounts, you know, change the insurance on the house, the, the life insurance, the pension, the, the cable TV, the gas, the water, the electric. There was 27 different companies I had to contact and change for my mum to help her. And I did it all, you know, all in a, I made a simple spreadsheet that she could follow. So it was all there for her. But you simply, it, if you've not been through it before, maybe you have, but you suddenly realize, wow, there's so much to do. And it's so much to do at a time in which your mind is already not tip top. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. grief doesn't leave us. I mean, we're, we're in a different space. So like my clarity right. is not as good right. as it might be on another day. Yeah. Um, yeah, this was my first experience with grief. My yeah. grandparents died when I was very young. So to lose my dad at, at 54, a couple of years ago, I was in shock. It was all new to me. And to think, okay, we've, we need to organize the funeral. We need to write, I needed to write the eulogy, the obituary. We, we then read the will. You know, there was all of these things new to me. I was like, whoa. So again, in my, this is all in my first book. Um, I talk about the process and the things to look out for, the do's and don'ts kind of thing, my story, but also the research I completed. And there's, there's things in here too about um, foods to eat and not eat. And we know sugar is bad for us, although we love sugar. Um, <laughs> but there's a lot of tips in here on what kind of food to eat and how to keep healthy and strong. Take and there's some mention, strong. yeah, and there's some mention in there about uh, the different signs as well. But I talk more in the second book about the signs. Um, but yeah, there's there's so much. Again, grief is complex. You know? Grief is complex. Mm -hmm. We all experience it. Some starting yeah. in very young ages, and some, you know, off and on throughout their lives. And some, like yourself, make it a good portion of their life without having to um, deal with it. And yeah. yet, we don't escape it. Yeah, so, that's right. Rich, as we're winding down the podcast, is there a last thought or message that you would like to leave our listeners with? Um, well, well, two two quick things then. Uh, firstly, as I mentioned before, please don't give up. I, we we know it's difficult. Nobody nobody can say I know what you're going through. They, I know people will do that out of the love and the kindness for you, but they don't truly know. Um, everybody, it's individual what you're going through, but you can cope with this. You can get through this. You just have to be patient. Keep an open mind. You might receive those signs from your loved one. Um, and the other thing I, I would like to do, say, if it's okay with you, can I close on a prayer? Absolutely. If I can just say a short prayer for our, our listeners? Absolutely. Okay. And then again, you can find me at richardjohnallen.com. That's my website. And we'll have that in the show notes, folks. All so right. don't worry thank about you. it. All right. Thank you. All right. I'll just say this short prayer. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for your countless blessings. We thank you not only for the food that we have to eat or for the comfortable place that we have to live, but for the beauty that surrounds us. We acknowledge you for the countless blessings that you have provided and that you continue to provide. We thank you for giving us clear direction through your holy word. Through the good times and the bad times, we thank you for this life. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. You've been listening to the No Labels, No Limits podcast with best-selling author, change agent, and strategic vision coach, Sarah Box. 
You can grab the show notes and find out how to work with Sarah at sarahbox.com forward slash no labels, no limits podcast. We'd love this podcast to reach as many people as possible. So please remember to rate, leave a five star review and share the podcast with someone you think would get value from this conversation. Until next time, keep taking those daily action steps to align your purpose to your principles and achieve your goals in business and life.